Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, we've been uh, through everything pretty much in Romans chapter 6, though we could spend a great deal more time there. Earlier in the series, we talked about the power of the law to arrest desire, but uh, how it, it doesn't do anything other than show you your failure. And Paul is feeling that acutely in Romans chapter 7, verse 15, where he says, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. In other words, if, if the law is condemning some action in me, and I agree that I hate it and don't want to do it, I agree with the law. The law is right. It's, it's good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Here it is. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. You underline that in your Bible? That's, that's uh, the typical Christian testimony. I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. That's a big problem. Let's say that little phrase in Scripture together. Say it. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Say it again. Share your testimony. I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Last time, what's your problem? I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. That's a big problem. That is a big problem. That's the problem that the disciples were facing when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And they, he said, come on, can't you even pray for one hour? And then he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Same thing. I have the desire to do what is right, but I can't carry it out. Uh, jot this down, uh, uh, the exhausting Christian life. That is exhausting. Wanting to do the right, but not being able to carry it out. This is the life most Christians lead. And I know this because this is the Christian life that I led for many years. I don't criticize the church I grew up in, not at all, certainly not my parents, nor the first church I worked in, nor the seminary or Bible college that I graduated from. But I was already a pastor at Harvest Bible Chapel before I learned what I'm going to teach you today. Okay? I was way down the line before somebody showed up with the power source. I was living a life of laws without life, rules without resource, precept without power to get it done. Now, that is an exhausting, excruciating Christian life. It causes many people to give up and slip back into what Romans 8 calls the carnal Christian life. Too many people listening to me right now on all of our six campuses, you're living the carnal Christian life. You're just, you try, you fail, you try, you fail, so you know what, you know what, dang it, I'm not going to try no more. I'm not going to try no more. I'll come to church often, I'll, I'll sing some songs, but I'm not engaged in my Christian life because I can't take the pain of trying and failing no more. It's exhausting. It was 10 years into Harvest Bible Chapel that I went on uh, a sabbatical and through uh, the graciousness uh, of some people, uh, we were um, uh, able to go overseas with our, Luke was in sixth grade, Landon in fourth grade, Abby in second grade, and we went overseas and stayed in some uh, government housing in uh, some places in England and in that area, and uh, one week we made ourselves to a place where uh, we actually stayed for free. It was a, a Christian retreat and training center founded by a guy named uh, Major, oh, there's the, a picture of it, but let's go back to the picture of the guy first, uh, Major Ian Thomas. He actually prayed in one of our services here a few years ago, a great Christian man. Here's a picture of him when he founded uh, this retreat center called Cape and Ray, and it's a castle uh, in the north of England, and it's a long story how they got it. You can look it up on the internet through the organization Torchbearers. 
And uh, they're responsible uh, in part for what is now uh, known as Keswick theology, uh, which is uh, this focus on where the power for the Christian life. I mean, this is a big problem I pointed out to you here. Think of the millions of Christians worldwide, all of whom would have to confess the same thing. I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. He goes on to say, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil that I do not want is what I keep on doing. Again, verse 19, I do not do the good I want. The evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. This is a problem. And I had been a pastor for 10 years, and my kids didn't have no idea, of course, being as they were so young, what was going on in my life. But I mean, I couldn't even go forward. I was at the place where I can't even go back to harvest. I can't even continue in ministry. I can't go forward another step if I don't get some kind of breakthrough or insight or understanding somehow into what fuels the Christian life. I just, I just, no one had ever taught that to me. I didn't understand it. I grew up in an environment that was very neglectful of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And while I was at Cape and Ray, the man who was the head of it at the time, he's since preached here in our church and is the pastor of People's Church in Toronto, Ontario. But uh, at the time, he was the head of Cape and Ray, and uh, his name is Charles Price. He wrote a book called Christ for Real. Awesome title. And uh, in it, he talks about his own exhausting Christian life, how when he came to Christ, he, he, he was like, okay, I got the fire insurance, I got the ticket, I got the certificate, I'm going to heaven. And he said, then I'd start reading my Bible or I'd listen to somebody preach and they'd emphasize something and I'd like, I gotta get me some more of that. And the preacher would talk about love and so he says, I'd go home and, and, and I'd say, God, make me more loving. And, and I'd kneel down and he said, I kind of pictured uh, my prayer going up to heaven and there were some angels who would, uh, I, like prayer was like, this is the catalog where you uh, discover all the things that God wants for your life. And so I'd take the catalog and then prayer was how you submitted your order. So I would like submit my order, God make me more loving, and I sort of pictured the angels in heaven taking my order and going down the aisle to the love aisle and, and finding some love and then sort of putting it on me. And then I'd go and hear a, a message about evangelism. So I'd go home and submit my order to be uh, more effective at sharing my faith. And I would picture the angels taking my order, going to the evangelism aisle, and giving me a greater desire to share my faith. Well, by the time you've listened to a lot of messages and read a lot of books and talked to a lot of Christians, you've submitted a lot of orders, and you're, Jug, make me more like this, make me more like this, make me more like this. And he describes a time in his life where it all came crashing down to the ground, and he had to say, I can't do all this stuff. I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. <laughs> 